Welcome, everybody. Um, it, it's a bit of a smaller screen, so please uh, try to move forward. We will have some interactive demo sessions with uh, code. Some of it will be visible where you all are, but uh, there, there is room up close. Um, also, the link at the bottom, which hopefully, like that, you should need to read, because uh, it's the link to the Google presentation which we're giving. So if you can see it here, you'll be able to see it on your own uh, screen. And maybe look ahead. Well, um, it's wonderful to be here for uh, this uh, add-on um, to the conference, this idea of a hands-on tutorial. This one's on uh, natural language processing with uh, a twist uh, with uh, the beginnings of uh, making it into kind of a, a big data mo um, theme of uh, velocity and volume. This is the structure of um, the presentation. We'll have an overview. There's a lot of text processing in, uh, to begin to do any interesting NLP, so we, we can definitely cover that, especially when there's a lot of volume there, like PDF files, say. Uh, some parsing, both at the syntactic level, just to begin to get a, a sense of where the structure is, and then at the semantic level, then, then uh, we'll, um, along the way we'll do some demos as well, but there is one section where it um, exposes some of the frameworks, and we'll, we'll do some demos live here with uh, Spark and with uh, Lambda. Classification, clustering, now we're getting into some, some of the application areas and uh, information extraction. And, and the most recent work with uh, uh, deep learning with word relatedness functions are, are becoming pretty hot, so we definitely are, are going to cover that as well. It's a lot of content. Uh, we're going to zoom through some of it. Also, I assume that all of you have a, a lot of disparate different interests. And so um, at some point during breaks, which I'll have to sync up, you, have you heard when the break is yet? No. Has anyone heard it yet? Well, we'll, uh, we'll discover it. In, in fact, um, after I announce you, maybe you could find Thanks. So who are we? Um, Gabor Meli on the left. I could have put the names. Matt Seal on the right. You're the right there. My left. You're right. Um, we both have had a lot of uh, work in the NLP space. I, I decided to do my PhD on the topic, and I'm fortunate that the wave sort of came at the same, at the right time, that there's enough demand of NLP to warrant some industry applications. And, um, but prior to that, I've had lots of experience in, in predictive modeling. So we're at OpenGov right now. It's a startup, four years old, which uh, helps local cities. We have 1,000 of, of them as customers. There's 40,000, which we see as a market. And there's a lot of, uh, description of their information with text. Not only, but uh, some text there, so part of the business cases we have are from there. But of course, we have to tell you where we're from. We're also hiring, and so uh, <laughs> mandatory statement. Uh, so the text analytics market is booming. Um, anyway, included in the presentation, so you, you have sense of, of the validity of the strength of the market. It's uh, growing. And one of these areas down there, it's government. Um, and so that's where we're representing uh, with OpenGov, but there's plenty of other um, domains that are even hotter, like finance. And in terms of big, the volume is definitely growing, but as you know, you can only write so much, though keeping up with text is not going to grow as much because it's sort of limited by the six or seven billion people that we have. Um, it, writing, well, maybe we'll, the machines will start writing and then, then it becomes a, a real problem. Most it's the, the variety and the velocity and the veracity, so hard to trust a lot of what's written out there. Um, the, the speed is quick though with tweet, tweet feeds. So that's um, fortunately the big uh, part of data science is not just volume, although it's hard to do some of this work on just a single machine. <laughs> um, so uh, the growth also, fortunately, is coming in uh, the, uh, our ability to process all this information and the expense to, uh, of it. So these are AWS uh, numbers. We, use, uh, we happen to be using AWS at, at OpenGov. So our demos are geared to there. I'm also hoping to get some coupons for them to, for you 
to do some of the demos that we have <coughs> here with a bit of a bonus, although they already have a free tier for you to use. So a lot of what we do here you could do for, for free or cheap. So after this tutorial, so you'll, you'll know how to create best practice baselines. So we're not going for the latest and greatest, but sort of the, a good solid foundation. And we'll point to some of the state art, art methods. Definitely more ways to learn about the topic. And um, gosh, we love this uh, uh, domain. That's our handle at, open, at opengov.com. So send us a note, and we're, we'd be glad to, to help out with something that's related to this topic, because we're going to continue to advance it. So here's a fun uh, bit of early uh, kind of an, a text NLP. This, hopefully it shows it, is uh, done through an, uh, analyzing written records in Europe over the period of time that's shown here. <clears throat> and you can see the migration of different languages. So you have to classify the language of the document. And there were several languages. And apparently the, there was a language called Mozarabic. Um, that was a mix of Arabic, and it just got pushed uh, straight down. This was done through, uh, it's a, just a wonderful visual representation of some um, text analytics. So we're here, the overview we're, is about to begin. We've sort of set the stage for what we're hoping to achieve. So um, what is NLP? It's machining that can process linguistic data. So we're, we're being fairly broad. There's way different ways you can slice and dice um, NLP, but it's basically machining that can take all this information. However, it does often assume that it's text. So some of these documents on the left that are a little more complicated are often dumbed down to text. We're going to make that assumption as well. It's um, certainly um, our expertise um, here. We're going to focus on that. Um, also, you can make, there's another framework we're going to look at. So not only is the text directly taken to some structured way, there's some semi-structure that's the intent of the JSON uh, representation. So here's some of those tasks. And we're going to be focusing less on the generation, not summarization of text, but on the, um, the tasks that you see bracketed there. You can learn more about this. It's an incredibly growing field the Coursera. There's a um, free lecture out there on NLP, and you can see all these uh, topics that could be covered. Cannot cover all this in three hours. It'd be where none of us can parse that quickly, and nor can I speak that quickly. But there's lots of amazing um, resources out there. What is uh, maybe ca qualifying what big is? So the volume isn't, um, as I mentioned, large. Even the Wikipedia itself is only about 43 gig. Um, that's, that's manageable. But uh, velocity is, is, is nice and high. Here's a, if you do a applied NLP, I recommend that you build a, not a framework of the technology, but of your capabilities. And here's one that we've uh, had some success with at OpenGov. So you fill in all these rows. When you have a project, you try to understand how you're, you're solving each of these different challenges. A lot of the challenges are not just uh, the, the frameworks, but also human and different areas of experience. Heuristic NLP is often <laughs> a, good, a wonderful place to start. You, you have some simple ideas for how to do end of sentence, dictionary base, name identity recognition, or Hearst patterns. Cities such as LA and New York City means that those are cities have a wonderful, a wonderful place to start, especially when you need to scale. I've not spoke yesterday to some people and at large companies that can't be named, apparently, um, that um, naive base is uh, like a, they use a lot of it for parsing all this, um, processing all this big data. But uh, sometimes you do um, have data-driven methods that you can process. And that's if you have a lot of extra text and you happen to have a lot of examples of what you want the text to be converted to. And or and you, have, you can have a machine there that looks at those two. Or even the information that's been extracted out of it. That can be a source of information. Or even the summaries. So I've done work on summarization. If you have examples of summaries, then you can use that. So these are. If you only have the data to the left, it's unsupervised. If you have the data to the right, then you have fully supervised. And then if you have both, you can have you can do even more uh, semi-supervised. So uh, as I mentioned, the data, uh, heuristic data-driven approaches often complement. So you first do the heuristic, and then uh, you, you take it to the next level of performance through some 
more sophisticated, automated, data-driven approaches. One of the, this is the wonderful thing to see when you do data-driven approaches, especially supervised ones, uh, that as you get more data, your performance goes up. Sometimes you can get uh, good enough data or good enough performance at an early stage and you can stop. But you draw this learning curve, uh, often on some kind of um, logarithmic scale um, or not, uh, and then you see how much data you need to get the performance you uh, also need. The, um, you'll do, need to do a lot of uh, evaluation of your processes, so you will always, as we find out, a lot of the work we do is create benchmark data sets, and um, they take months often to create so that you know what ground truth is, so that you can then challenge your team to improve the performance. So that uh, a goal data set uh, we often refer to as. So you have to invest in some custom annotation tools often. Um, they don't have to be that sophisticated. Um, it's, we've had some success even just with uh, Google spreadsheets, just labeling things. Um, but on the left, uh, at BigLink, we, we did do some uh, use of uh, some annotation tools, which I can describe later. The guidelines for the annotation is also maybe a, little, a lot more involved than what you experience in other uh, data science projects because there's a lot of uh, tacit knowledge that we have in an, um, when we read that needs to be described so that when you hire somebody, which um, let's say uh, through Upwork, you'll need very clear guidelines to help them make those nuanced decisions. A lot of work goes into it. As it's not as exciting as interesting, sorry, but, uh, but that's why I'm here to tell you some of the best practices. There is a sense that you could do general kind of NLP. Maybe that's great if you work at a very, very large organization that needs to have general knowledge because you have millions of users. But most often you have the domain specific niche that you're, you're in government or you're in medicine or in the legal world or in recipes. So, here are some examples that I've had a hand in, and myself or Matt. So at Vaguelink, we inserted hyperlinks in, in sort of blog posts. And one thing that we did that's a little novel is we ran a contest, a Kaggle contest for this project. And uh, we happened to co-locate co it with IEEE ICDM. The, the learning from that is that, and here's the, the challenge, given a passage like the one at the top, we needed to find, uh, sorry, um, that it was an Apple 24 cinema display, and we needed to determine which one to hyperlink it to. Um, so this thing we solved with uh, conditional random fields up down here, and this with support, support vector machines and um, on Elasticsearch. What we found was crowdsourcing, which might be one of the appeals that you get faced with, was um, it did force the creation of that benchmark task, uh, the data set. So that's the one thing that you, I, I recommend for you to experience. Um, it really does force you to do the hard work, because then you're a public, and then you, you know that you don't want to waste resources and your time. The, the results are a little um, difficult to to interpret sometimes. So if you ask them to also publish a paper, or write a paper about their methods as, let's say, the KDD Cup did today, or actually, I'm forgetting if it's today or tomorrow, uh, you'll get a lot more insight as to where the, 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 the key ideas were, what features, what methods. Very time consuming, and maybe, maybe some expense as well. So we released this data set uh, in JSON so that one of the challenges is when we do release, let's say, text data, it's very difficult to know when we have the results back from them that we could align our results in very precisely. So we decided to pre-tokenize the data so that we knew exactly when, when tokens started and finished. Um, Another one is uh, offer parsing. So if we have this, uh, let's say from Amazon, we want it to break it down into something like this, nicely structured. You can imagine that, that helps to do something like this. You, you can now fill in a database of all this product. So this was done through uh, conditional random fields on trained data. We trained, we annotated a thousands or so um, lines, which 
by then we, we started to get interesting accuracy, especially once you have a, con a confidence score, which allows you to decide whether you trust some of the outputs that they have. Um, there, there's an online uh, link there for you to try it yourselves. Another example I have is, can you spot subcellular sub localization events? So there's a, an abstract of paper. This was uh, for real, it was, but it was for a bit of an academic pursuit. We did help a database for but a hospital they'd end up using. But so here, the, I'll, I'll get down to the point. These are the three key sentences in that big abstract. And I've already pre-annotated with named entity recognition, say. But you want to find these three, that link and these two links. How do you do that? We'll talk a little bit more about it later um, so that you can fill in this uh, database of information. We ended up constructing a text graph of this. So every, all those three sentences are linked. And we could then run um, some support vector machines to find which of those paths um, were the ones that, were, whether any of them really were uh, candidates for entry into the database. Not all were, very few were actually. Uh, another one is, um, so every proceeding for, K, for KDD I process through conditional random fields and the idea um, with that is that I can create um, semi-structured information about when, when the paper is written, um, what it's talking about. So um, stay tuned for that description. But you hear that there's a lot of sequence. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting tasks you can do just by labeling sequences. I, this is not my own. Uh, a colleague of mine has done recipes. But even the, the part of the reason they covered it is that even the New York Times covered it. They themselves use conditional random fields to do the extraction. We are going to be using a fair bit of NFTK. It's not necessarily. Um, that robust in terms, but it's, it's uh, sufficient if you put some exception handling around it. Um, but there are plenty of other tools. It's just that to make it simple to con have, and be consistent, we, are, we do use it, and so we're going to show a lot more of it here. But it's definitely got a lot of uh, interesting libraries. It is Python based. We're also going to show NLP on Spark. So, uh, as, as you've heard, Spark is a sort of a simple way. And, modern way to get distributed cluster per computing without you having doing all the, the jigging of this de delivering the work to the nodes. We're going to show that. There is a, a document here which allows you to walk through and create your own and do this process that we are going to show you. It sets up an EMR, Elastic Map Reduce Cluster on Amazon, and in, with an RTK and does a job of PDF, PDF processing. I'll try to talk about it. It's just a matter of time permitting. We'll see how much, <laughs> much of that we can show. But the, the link is there, so um, it's been tested. <laughs> and we'll see what happens live. Also, um, who's heard of uh, Lambda service? It's a new service by Amazon that allows you to be reactive. So with Spark, it's this big investment. You set up this cluster, and maybe it's not doing any work for half the time, maybe more. With Lambda, you just do, do code, and it reacts. So you only pay for the time that it's, you've received some work. Um, the one challenge is that you can only do five minutes of work at most time. So um, I'll show you that. It's, it's sort of interesting. That document takes you to a demo, the, a page that shows you how to set up your own service like that. So. We're going to now begin with uh, the text processing. That was the overview of like you know the kind of tools and the kind of work and case studies. Uh, and I mentioned text segmentation. So here, end of sentence detection, uh, text tokenization, word segmentation, stemming, limitization, and here are the demo uh, the the uh, is samples. Uh, if I could get a sense of how many people in the audience know these concepts of. Uh, Let's say lemmatization. Just so I know, like the, the sense of ex great, good. Well, that was about what do you say, Matt? Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Getting un trying to get unbiased here. Um, so um, there's some of you know this, and many of you I just need to to catch up on it. But I do have links on these that go to a knowledge base that I maintain that describes these in much more detail, both what they mean, how they can be used, 
So part of what I see here is I can point you to some directions. They, it, I, I've shown some illustrative examples as to why you want to do this, because walls, when you stem it, which is the simple method of just truncating it with some heuristics, gives you something that is non-real. Uh, so um, here's a, a nice tool that allows you to interact, so be, to get familiar with the capabilities and what are the meaning of these um, transformations are. Um, I guess I'd love for this tool to be, to be mine, but anyway, someone's already done it, so. Uh, string segmentations, uh, now I'm getting deep into some of the processes that need to be involved. So you can have a partial segmentation where you're only looking for specific things in a text, say uh, a word or a phrase or a person's name or a product's name. But as I showed you in the parsing of the offer title, we want a complete process, uh, parsing of everything. Certainly there's mathematical ones where now you need to get into some of the syntactic meaning or um, getting all the components, the morphemes of, of the, the word. Also to remember that uh, string segmentation and what we do with text is not just text-based. Even DNA genetic analysis benefits from the sequence. There are many other places where there is structured sequential information. Look at there approaches to help you determine what you can do with text. Those happen to be introns, so um, there's a lot of processing to find them. As I mentioned, uh, there are some links down here. These take you down. The one on the four, bottom left takes you back to the top of text processing. The one up the right gives you a link, a handle to more information about how to well, think about this task and tools to, to solve them. Then. Now that one of the differences that you've, I'm sure, have uh, will begin to see is the sense of how you determine accuracy. There's a lot more opportunity for being sort of fuzzy about your sense of the performance of a system. Because um, I've included several of them. If you get partially, if you get user generated, um, but it's a, your intended chunk, but you then did user generated content store, how much do you penalize? the behavior, the prediction. So, for example, it could be binary performance, it's yes or no, that's nice, because then you can have, you can leverage all the history of um, precision and recall and F1 scores. Or you can even decide whether you can, you want more recall, more precision with different levels of um, F, F scores, which is a harmonic mean. The nice thing about these Oh, I'll show it momentarily. Another way to, to calculate the performance is against an optimal decision. So this is accuracy. And the, one of the interests in using F1 is that it penalizes being weak in one over the other. So if you have zero weak, almost zero recall, you get zero F1. That's a wonderful property to condense and penalize the strike a balance between the two. Another um, metric that you'll see is uh, inter-annotator agreement. So if you ha when you have two annotators, which ideally you, sh you should in that it tells you the upper bound of how well could a human really do this task. You know, hardly ever, hardly, most tasks cannot get 100% um, results of agreement between users. And now you have a metric to, to show how much there is. Now that we've done the, the sentence uh, detection sort of in a low level, there's a, a larger level of structuring, finding the, the ends of sentences. Sometimes it's trivial, uh, as you know, periods and exclamation marks, but there's plenty of um, possibilities to go wrong there with um, titles, say. So text, text tokenization itself is challenging, especially maybe if there's different languages. So here's a nice, I've verified that this is, can actually be said in German. <laughs> it's a very, very, very long uh, word that needs to be broken down. And um, what it, well, uh, it's, it's uh, I, I put the, uh, the English on in parentheses. And, and I, I did come up with some very 
challenging examples there for you. So how can you do that? Well, here's with NLTK, different kinds of um, tokenizations that they have. So, um, what, and the outcomes. NLTK on IPython, who, um, let's say, well, this one's probably gonna be easier, so who's, who's first used NLTK before? Wonderful, um, maybe that same 30%. <laughs> and uh, how about IPython now, though? Then that should be a little bigger. Wonderful. Some familiar faces there. So uh, the combination is um, doable, and so Matt's going to give you a bit of description of, of doing some of that um, word segmentation. Giving these examples. Uh, so um, one of the first preliminary tasks that you might want to end up doing, unfortunately, it's surprising we still do this, but there's a lot, of, even this community releases a lot of PDF. It uh, goes from LaTeX to something wonderful to then something not so good. Um, so um, we, we do a fair bit of PDF processing ourselves, but not, we're gonna show you with some simple tools and um, Matt's put some code together for this. Oh, is, is it the coffee break now? I believe it might be. 9.30. Someone who uh, runs the coffee setup here, they could tell us if the 9.30 coffee break is outside. Are you, are you ready to continue a little bit? Uh, I can go ahead. Yeah, um, let's do a little bit, I think, uh, just so we have a little bit of motion, momentum here. Excuse me for a second. Um, my Linux driver does not like changing uh, screens, so I have to tell it to go back to mirroring. So uh, my name is Matthew Seal, and uh, I'm going to walk through a few slides about kind of the challenges you, you run into with parsing real budgets and real PDFs. Give us a second. The uh, driver should come back up. Um, and I'm going to walk through kind of what are some gotchas, what are some things to, to watch out for when you're parsing PDFs, and then we'll walk through a little bit of how, how you take the content out of those and, and manage it. So uh, one of the, the you know, challenges with, uh, with uh, PDF parsing is the fact that uh, these files are kind of big, bulky, and they can have all sorts of content in them. So we, we think of uh, NLP and, and text processing when we have nice, rich, uh, clean data fields coming back. But PDFs oftentimes have uh, direct mistakes, machine mistakes, human mistakes, and uh, a lot of different encodings that don't always come out into a nice, nice text format. The other thing is that many times to extract this information, it can be quite expensive. Um, pulling out good text information from a nice PDF can be quick, but if there's uh, flaws or images in there, you can have, might have to go through pipelines that are a lot slower in order to get the uh, value back out of the document. Um, and so all the things I'm going to show you here, um, at the very end, you know, when, we, when we walk through actually uh, parsing these things, you'll be able to just add a couple lines of code and parallelize the whole process without having to think about it as you go. So um, we have a, we uploaded a, a big collection, not, not a giant one, but a decent sized collection of uh, budget PDFs from uh, local governments around the country. So we work in the uh, local government space at OpenGov and uh, there's, there's just a ton of data just trapped in these PDF files. Um, and so some of that data includes uh, what the kind of vernacular of our, of our community is. So when I first started OpenGov, there was sort of this big lack of the ability to go access uh, data repositories that would tell you about what are the key phrases, what do they mean, are they different in this, in this niche as opposed to another niche. And uh, the domain knowledge was kind of locked up and encoded in people's heads and in these budget PDFs. So um, it actually, if you even just, if you copy this, uh, 
HTML that's on the left here from the slide, you can go do a viewer and walk through the S3 files. Otherwise, uh, the link on the uh, slide as well will just take you to an XML form of the data. And we'll, we'll process some of this data today. Um, and that data is up, up for free, so it's on a public S3 route, so it should be there for all time if you guys want to use it or, or use it as a, um, an example data set. All right, so here's something that's, that's really common in, in uh, parsing budget PDFs, uh, so in, in PDFs in general. So you get these sentences where we want these really nice sentence tokens so that we can know how to parse the sentence appropriately and, and extract uh, some of those parse trees and valuable artifacts out of the, the data to, to get real value. Um, and the problem is, as you can see things like here we're on the right, you can get these sentences that get broken up. You can get uh, extra pun uh, punctuation in, in odd places. You can get uh, OCR text errors. So like at the bottom, you can see things mashed together with a zero and no spaces. So these become actually really challenging. And, and some of the algorithms for figuring out that you've got these errors are n squared so or, or naively n squared. So it can sometimes take a little while when you get, um, and sometimes they're valid, like the sentence you saw earlier in the, uh, German. Um, these really long, long text fields can be, can be painful to extract out. Um, so uh, what, what, what's some actual example of this that we want to pull out? Here's a, an example taken from one of those files that's up there. It's a little hard to read, but uh, if you zoom in on your local, you'll, you'll be able to read it closer. I just wanted to kind of show more of the structural problems there. So you'll see there's this table embedded in the middle of, uh, of the data here. Uh, yes, they should be linked as well. Um, if, they're, uh, if they're not right after this, I'll make sure they get, they get added to that at one in between switching speakers. Um, there's two different slide decks. They should both be linked on there. And the one slide deck links to this one. This one just has a, f a few uh, side notes on, on its own outside of the, the main course, more the implementation side. Um, okay, uh, I'll fix that right after this. Sorry about that. Um, so the, the raw text here, um, has as information here that is hard to extract, and that uh, that data can be uh, painful to, to go to go find. So there's some tools you can use that will help pull that out. So the standard, you know, if you do PDF to text, is a really standard process that will get you, you know, some of the easy sentences. But then you might have to do a little extra pre-processing, and really you do this until you get to an accuracy that that you um, that you care about. Um, you can also get things like this where, you know, especially with academic papers where they'll split text up in two different columns. And the way that gets represented in a PDF, it, there's about like five different ways it can, it can represent that separation of content. So many of the par different parsers will give you different structures of sentences. Could you look at uh, opening up permissions on my slides? So um, basically what I'm, what I'm getting at here is you're going to get some level of information loss when you parse these richer documents and, and pulling down to text. And if you, my recommendation when you get to this is that you, you walk through and you let yourself have that level of loss and then you evaluate if, if you need to come back and get more information out of it. So the, the very easy step is a one line call, you know, PDF to text and then you have a text file, right? And you can walk forward and see how well that does. If you find there's a lot of problems or you have missing domain knowledge, uh, it's a good idea to come back and look and see if there's ways of pulling out this other information. Um, and in particular, like tables and graphs are, are really hard to parse. There's a few tools online uh, that, have, that have cropped up on and off. Some of them go down. So the one I, I'd actually used before is no longer up. But there they, they are a fair number of options for trying to get uh, the tabular data out as well. All right, so, so what are some things that we would actually want to extract from these PDFs? Uh, you know, I talked about getting the value out of, out of these uh, files. Uh, one of the big things you can get is corpuses. Um, so, you know, you can think of the domain-specific corpuses are actually very, very valuable for doing analysis in, in a particular domain. Um, you, you, there's a lot of general corpuses online. You know, there's actually tons of them. I mean, Google publishes them. They've got the, the uh, Wikipedia. Uh, many other places, the uh, older older parts, even NLTK comes with like brown corpus and a few other corpuses that are that are um, more general text. But what ends up happening is if you use that text, you'll run into problems with things like uh, the word court and law and tennis mean very different things in local government as opposed to in the general space. So the weight of what what things are important and, and where the information content is gets shifted. Oh, and uh, the slide should now be accessible.
Um, and so, you know, one of the big things we really want to uh, extract out of this uh, also is the information content. So NLTK, a lot of, a lot of uh, tree search algorithms rely on information content. And information content basically um, tells you how valuable a particular word or sense of a word is. So when you see words in text, what they really are is mentions to some idea. This is what we think of like a dictionary entry in, in, uh, uh, for the word. Uh, in this case at the top, parser, right? In this case, parser has one definition, but work below it has many, many different definitions. So we don't know which version of work they're talking about at any one given point. Um, and knowing which of those are commonly used helps you identify uh, the value of seeing that word in, in, in a text document. Um, and going through, we're gonna walk through and build one of these uh, uh, Synset corpuses later. Um, so a bunch of you asked for uh, an easier access to the down downloads for were listed on the IPython pages, but we also just put it in the slides and I'll update the repository with a little script that, that says how to run it. Um, some of the downloads are kind of big, so we didn't, I didn't actually expect everyone to download the, uh, the larger components and run through everything as we're going. So I consider like uh, go through the easy parts with us and then uh, the harder parts that need bigger file downloads, so I'll try running them afterwards. But uh, if you run into trouble, you know, we're very willing to uh, get feedback or ask for help from uh, us on our email, so. The link down here uh, is the link to the slides that Matt is going through in a shortened version, LP1AQO. However, we're gonna return um, to the one on top, the, the overview to lead up to some of the other work that Matt's uh, covered. So let me just get to slide 57, I believe. Good, so um, now you have a sense of some of the approaches work to actually get this done to convert these PDF files into text. Some of the other um, challenges around text is um, now beginning to be, uh, become a little more semantic, the idea of multi-word expressions, the sense when there's um, a heavy smoker cannot be changed for a fur furious smoker, say. Um, there's a lot of extra work, and now if, you're, if your task really requires you to be precise about the meaning, you're going to involve, need to understand collocations. Often these are uh, solved maybe with dictionaries of, of them. Sorry about that. Idioms, idioms like kicking the bucket is uh, another one that uh, is not, um, you can't understand by the components. He doesn't dread the bucket. He to keep tab on, tabs were kept on. So the difference between the idioms and the collocations is that there is some ability to play with the words. Um, but next. So as I mentioned, often you would have to, one of the ways you can handle those collocations, idioms, is to create a lexicon. And not just that, a lot of tasks will, will benefit from you creating a lexicon. There are some out there, uh, word now will be mentioned momentarily, but really your domain if need, will likely demand that you yourself invest in creating a lexicon for your specific needs. And also my sense is that if the task is important enough for you and your company organization, then it's important you have enough resources to create one of these and manage one of these lexicons. So that, so that's where I can um, challenge anyone that says that there's a lot of onerous work. We, had, when my prior position at Viglink, we had a, an annotator working full time and would annotate 100 or so different words every day. One other way though is you can do mutual information analysis. Um, in this approach, it's not a necessarily a big data approach, but it's um, in its word to phrase. Uh, who's used word to vec, that sort of famous um, deep learning approach to uh, similarity? I recommend you try it. It's definitely NLP. And included in there, they recognize themselves that they wanted to do 
the analysis, not just at the token level, at the word level, but at the phrase level, they've implemented a simple, nice, and fast, uh, mutual information-based uh, kind of uh, annotator. Or MLTK collections is another one. It's running a little slow. So that you can do some of these um, combinations where you can say Orlando Magic, Herbo are one thing, and now you can do more interesting search. Let's say you've done, done this parsing. Now you can find the Herbo for Orlando Magic, whereas before you would have uh, gotten a lot of noise if you had done uh, that search. Or Nike Air, Zoom Turf. Proper names are can be found this way. Median. Hmm. Maybe I should switch to a PowerPoint here. So to uh, so to identify them, um, so that you can go from that raw to this. Um, in this example, we use the word-to-phrase uh, system that looks at the, the large corpus to know what is commonly present and based on mutual information, based on the combination of entropy and that it's not too unpopular, but it's not also very frequent. So once you download it, for example, there's that program, and it's uh, really uh, simple to compile uh, with new tools. This is a, a little painful. I may have to switch. Or you can use, uh, from an LTK, there's the, uh, the idea of first doing bigrams, not, not you have to, you're constraining it to not three, but only two words at a time. You can, then you can grow it iteratively, go from tri bigrams to trigrams. It's not an idea that some don't naturally go flow where a trigram, a three word, or is, can be first found by a two word, but it's a simple heuristic that seems to work. If you happen to have a, Sometimes the term expression gazetteer is uh, used. It's the idea of a dictionary of these words. Uh, once you have those, then you can simply do a replacement here. You can do it as a, as a one-liner or even have it uh, slightly more sophisticated here where it's done in place. You may notice that some um, prayer idioms, there's a lot of the original work in, in NLP was done uh, with Perl because of the wonderful regex uh, abilities, but the transition to Python is, is, seems to be going well. Some other ones are Wiktionary, English Common Words, BattleNet, Metathesaurus. This one is, though, for medicine. So there are a few domains that just have done a lot of investment that you can benefit from. Yes. Goodness. We may switch to you, Matt, and then while I move to PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit, and we're actually gonna run some code here in a second. Um, uh, the the thing we want to kind of get back to this sort of what what is this dictionary meaning? What's a lexicon, and, and where where can you find information about this? So text data has many different ways you can interpret and look at it. Uh, one of the things you, you can do is actually build what's called a parse tree, which is what you see over here. Um, this is generated by the, the Stanford NLP parser, um, where it will, it will basically look at all the words in, in your sentence structures and organize them and tell what the relationships and the, the types of words that are used in, in different places in your sentence. Um, and the reason why this is um, really useful for us is we want to know, given a word in a particular sentence, what sense is that word that's being used? Um, we want to know how often certain senses appear. But if you generally just try and take some example sentences that use that word in that sense, you don't have very many samples. So a lot of the kind of naive approaches, like just counting the, the overlap of words in the sentences or um, even, you know, sometimes basic vectorization won't actually tell you that the word is being used in the same manner. You'll get too sparse of, of an overlap. So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to uh, expand the sentences into a more general, this general tree structure, which um, takes away what the exact meaning of the words in the sentence are and more about how the, how the sentence is being used. So you want to find sentences that have similar use, use patterns. And then 
uh, take the similarity between those structures that you pull out to identify which sense of the word is most likely to be to be used. Obviously, this is also naive. Like we have no prior here. We're not doing a trained model. This is sort of an unsupervised way to sort of build up some some knowledge base um, that you can come back to and improve later uh, to a much uh, better degree. Um, so we're going to do some little coding here and pop over to IPython. If you want to follow here, you can. It does, this code will run some kind of hefty downloads. So I do suggest if you haven't already downloaded it, and apologies for not having those download links ahead of time, uh, to run them offline afterwards. Um, but it should be uh, easy to follow, and it's not very long, and it's easy to come back to. All right, let's make this. Is that big enough for everyone to see? Can I get a thumbs up? A wave? Are we alive? Great. <laughs> okay, so at the top here is just a, a little snippet where, um, you know, how to install some dependencies that are used in here. It's mostly just for convenience. Also, if you look in the repository, there's in the readme, it has the instructions for installing everything. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Will you make these notebooks available afterwards? They are actually available already. If you go to the, in the slides, they link to the GitHub repo that has all these put up. Um, so you can just download and run them yourself. Um, so, yeah, right, we're, we're going to pull in a few dependencies here. So uh, there's some, like, nice little libraries that, that do a lot of the work, heavy lifting for us. Uh, yes, is there a problem? Uh, sorry, I can't quite hear you. Okay, I think any bigger and we'll start getting too much wrapping, so we'll try that. Um, so we're going to have a, a few different uh, libraries here that are really useful. Um, using this WordNet corpus, which has a lot of kind of traditionally like, gold standard approaches to doing things. Um, there's, there's stronger ones out there in, in custom solutions now, uh, but they're, they're great for getting off the ground. Um, and then uh, if we're going to use the Stanford has a, uh, a little Python wrapper on their Java uh, syntax parse, parser. And then the ZSS is just a, a really lightweight little um, tree li graph library that lets you uh, diff between different different uh, trees. Okay, so uh, let's see what, what does the Stanford uh, parser do? Like say we have a sentence here um, and we've gotten some text out of a, out of a PDF or out of, out of one of our sources and we say, you know, we want to know what, what is the artifacts this thing can generate? This is just one example of what, what this can run. Um, so we have, we pulled in this parser from the NLP um, engine, and we've asked, hey, take this sentence in and break it into parts. So you see here it has some basic information like where the character offsets, the boundaries are of the words that it thinks are in there. You'll see these, uh, these dependency, basic dependencies and uh, closed dependencies. Um, and those basically say what the relationship between the different tokens are. So this is part of those, these are the edges in that graph that we saw earlier. And then down here, we have a few other things like a, here, here's the parse tree in text form. And then we have part of speech and lemmas. So these are, we talked about lemmas earlier, sort of what the, the tokens that the words are representing um, and, and how this parser thinks about this. What this gives us is, is really is this part of speech tagging and the, uh, the dependency tree, which is going to let us do some, do some nice things. So one thing is uh, we want to simplify this a little bit. Uh, so when we read those tags, we're going to convert some of the many types of tags just into their basic component parts. And then um, we have this uh, part of speech dependency tree. So we want to convert those trees that we saw into something that we, we can manage. So it gives us in sort of a raw format, and we want to get the tree structure back up. So this is going to do is we're, we're going to um, run through, load up uh, the parse tree for a particular parsed content. So we assume we've run something in the parsed argument through this parser. And we're going to go grab all of the uh, part of speech tags and in their indexes. And then we're going to go through each dependency edge and we're going to build up uh, a little node and make this structure here where we make uh, three nodes, uh, the part of speech tag, the relationship to the next part of speech tag, and the destination part of speech. This gives us tree structures. So when we run this, uh, we will get a, a nice, and I'll show you what that tree structure looks like. So um, we have a few wrappers here. So let's go ahead and how can we convert a sentence into something into something nice? So we're going to be able to take in a sentence and then get back out this uh, tree structure that we've asked for. And then uh, down below here, we're going to do this. Uh, ZSS comes with a very nice uh, tree uh, similarity function. So uh, we're going to basically 
uh, take this simple distance. You can do something more complicated, but this just basically looks at what the edit distance is between the two trees. So if you need to add a node, it'll say plus you need you have edit distance one. If you need to remove a node, one. If you need to edit something, one. And you can weight them and do other things too. And we're going to add a little bit of this thing called this oops this smoothing function in here. Uh, just because what ends up happening is you don't see very many things at edit distance 1. You see many things at edit distance 4, edit distance 10. And if you don't add a little bit of smoothing, you really heavily weight um, the sort of matches that are, the matches that are all far away look the same distance. So this helps uh, differentiate a bit. Great. So we're going to, let's go ahead and run this through and we'll see what, you know, some of these, some of these artifacts are. Um, you can see I ran this right before we got started um, just to save a little bit of a, uh, confusion on things moving on the screen. Um, but you could run this, lot. I could rerun this if you, you wanted to. So we have uh, these uh, parsers, we have a few sentences here. Two of them are pretty similar. You know, they're, uh, they only have a you know, one word difference. They're really kind of touching on the same subject. And then we have some other sentence that it doesn't really relate at all. And we can see here, if we do the uh, edit distances between um, the first sentence and the second sentence, we get an edit distance of two. So the distance in their two trees is very close. Um, and if we look at the uh, edit distance between the first and the third, you know, we get a very high number. So we get these large numbers here that tell us that they're far away and that those two sentences aren't probably talking about the same uh, type of, uh, com they aren't communicating in the same manner. But they might be talking about the same subject. And then the similarity function here just gives us, great, now we can go get similarity, which was the function up above. So now we've converted these distances into a score that's between zero and one. Um, and now we have a, a way of sort of saying, are these two sentences similar? And we don't have to have a lot of samples to, to find that out. Great, so um, now we want to do things like, let's go ahead and walk through um, all the sentences and do, do a bunch of parsing. Like, let's say we have one target sentence. We've read a sentence from our text. And we want to know, uh, uh, for that sentence against a bunch, uh, a set of other sentences, uh, how do they match up against them? So we can just do this really basic, you know, looping over. Uh, yield out the, the sentence that we did and the dependency similarity that we did above and just get some scores for um, how, how well these sentences are doing. So you see on here we, we do this with those same sentences and you get those same scores again, but it's kind of a nice format. Uh, we're just kind of incrementally getting closer to something that's easy to consume. All right, so now we're going to get to the synset part. Uh, so what we're going to do here is uh, the synsets that come from WordNet, a synset, uh, you can take a word and you can ask for all the synsets. Uh, all the synsets are the uh, potential interpretations of that word, and but it doesn't tell you which ones are are, are are you know most important or most common or anything like that. So what we're doing here is we're getting all those synsets, and each of those synsets comes with an example says example sentences. Most just have one example sentence, but so we just grab one and pretend there's only one. Um, some of them I believe have have multiples you could use, um, and so we get the name of the synset and an example sentence from it. And that lets us, now we have an example sentence for one potential meaning, which means if we get all the potential meanings of a word, and then we get all of the uh, s example sentences, we can now have that function that takes one sentence in and a bunch of potential sentences to target and give us a weighting about which ones are uh, the most likely uh, uh, match. And that's exactly what this does here. So we take that other, we're going to basically run over. Uh, grab the uh, expansion of, so we're going to take in a sentence and we're going to go expand it out with a function above and then we're going to get these names and examples and then down here we're going to do this, this is a rather slow step. So right here we're not optimizing very much um, this step of, of getting these scores here, we're doing this sentence match score. The standard LP parser, while fast, is still relatively slow compared to what you think of a parse text uh, reading. So it has to do pretty complicated operations, so you're, you're talking on the order of you know less than a a hundred parses per minute, and oftentimes with big sentences, it's it's more, uh, you know, you're looking at seconds to parse a sentence sometimes, which means it's it's kind of heavy lifting. So this type of work is really good to distribute. Um, and uh, down here, we're just going to basically weight each of the scores. Uh, so we get the name and the score, and then we're going to get uh, for that name what's the weight of each potential meaning. We we normalize it so that they all sum the one. So what does this look like? Uh, what we say, how do these parsers work anyway? That sentence before. Well, let's go and see what, what comes out of that. Um, here we've, we've basically gotten all the words that showed up and their potential weights about which version of that word it was most likely matching. Um, and this gives us some, a, an artifact now that we can use. We can use this now to say, great, if I see this word again in this context, I can assume or at least have an educated guess that it's 
in this distribution of, of associated meaning. Um, and now we can build, this is what is the basis for building information content. Um, and obviously, you know, we skipped over, this is unsupervised. We're just building up this, this thing to look at. We haven't evaluated how well it does, but it's a good starting place to get going. And, and then here I just did a little helper. Um, don't worry about this so much, but it basically just goes through and uh, mashes multiple senses together and then just prints out the top 20 of results. So here we grab all the senses we worked on before and you can see we're combining the counts up. So we're effectively getting a count for the different uh, occurrences of words, of uh, synsets. And then we do this with a uh, Gutenberg text. We go ahead and go grab uh, a common Gutenberg text. It's pretty slow, so we only do a couple sentences just to show it. And you get you know, the same thing happening in, in these other uh, common texts so we can get domain knowledge and start running this. It is slow. You run on a single machine. You try and do it for a lot of sentences. It's going to be pretty slow. We can optimize up above. Um, we could go ahead and go uh, you know, cache the synset parsing, which is the majority of the work. So if you build those parse trees, you can just save them out and then read them from a save location instead of reparsing them over and over again. But in general, uh, this is a great, great ability to go uh, parallelize this thing. So here we've got a little bit of a snippet of code. I actually didn't run it in here because I haven't set up the Spark context. But this is all the code you would need to run everything there in a distributed manner on a Spark cluster. So this last cell will do exactly what we just the work we just did, but on a distributed manner. So we didn't have to think about how do we distribute this work, right? We just defined how we process a sentence, how we convert it into a token that we can use. And now down here, what we're going to do is we, this, this will take in, read in a PDF, um, convert that into, uh, tokenize it in the sentences, and then it will uh, parallelize those. So you can give it a list, you know, a many different budgets in this case, have it process all of those in parallel on different workers and scale it up as much as you want. And the result down here with the code that runs will do the transformation. So we'll, we'll go ahead and read those names in and put them into the uh, Spark workers. And then we'll load up the sentences on those. And then we will get the synset counts for each of those sentences that independently get added. And these give us these uh, data frame RDD objects, which uh, I won't go into right now, but they're sort of how you store, one of the ways you store data in Spark in a distributed manner. Um, at the end, but that's all, these are all just uh, Lambda functions, right? You're just doing functional programming on the things we already defined earlier. And then at the bottom here, we go ahead and we aggregate uh, these results together. So what this means is we each worker independently will build up its own count of uh, synsets and their value. And then at the end, we just need to add them all together. And that's all we do here. At the end of this, you'll get, the, you know, we take the five of these examples, we would get the sense and the global count across all the files you just processed. Um, and this is something, you know, now you can run and now you actually have this, this distribution that you can use in different ways. Right, so that's the, the sample here that we, we, we're uh, walking through, and I encourage you to try this out offline and, and shoot email questions if you run into problems or questions.